Okay, so this is part two, and in this one, we're going to talk about um, the painting of Michelangelo, even though he would prefer that we talk about his sculpture. He did do paintings, and they were actually very influential for the styles that we're going to look at afterwards. So pretty important that we cover this. So the first piece we're looking at is his uh, Donitando Holy Family. Uh, so we have Mary, um, Joseph, and Jesus right here, uh, and then a bunch of kind of random Greek nudes in the background. Um, kind of an interesting setup there. Um, so we can see already some of the things that we'd seen in the High Renaissance, this kind of pyramid that's being made. Um, and we're starting also to see some of the things that we'll see with Michelangelo, where he's exaggerating the bodies. He begins to use um, masculine models for feminine bodies. Uh, to make them more muscular and massive. Um, and then <laughs> even Jesus is is packing a lot in this one as a baby. Um, the other thing that I wanted um, to show this one for is because the colors are very bright. Um, and that will kind of be important when we look at the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel. So this is the Sistine Chapel, the way it looks today. Um, and it's probably one of Michelangelo's most famous pieces. Um, but Michelangelo, again, he would prefer that we, <laughs> we think that his sculptures are the best. Uh, so the measurements of this are about um, 40.93 meters wide um, long and 40 meters wide. So the idea with this is that it's the exact measurements of the Temple of Solomon, which is in the Old Testament in the Bible and it's about 20 meters high. Um, so it's a big building, and when you see it, though, it looks like the ceiling is curved. Uh, it's not, it's flat, um, so there's a little bit of an illusion going on there um, with Michelangelo uh, that we had seen previously in the uh, early Renaissance. So Michelangelo, he was pretty inexperienced in fresco when he got this commission, uh, so he found some people that knew what they were doing, uh, and he enlisted a bunch of assistants. Uh, he did a lot of the work himself. <laughs> and it's not easy work when you're painting on the ceiling. Uh, you're basically laying down and getting paint in your eye. Um, but he was able to do it eventually. Um, but when you look at some of the details, like the architectural details, a lot of that stuff was probably painted by assistants. Uh, and then he would prefer to work on the figures so they can have his sculptural thing having, happening. Um, so the story that we're looking at the ceiling, we're going to look at the, the last judgment fresco over here on the wall, which was made much later. Um, but the story with the ceiling is basically so to show the short story of Christianity. Um, so it starts with the old Testament, um, and the most famous one, which I'm circling right now uh, is the creation of man. So, um, and when I say man in this one, I mean that literally, uh, not as a, uh, not talking about humans in general. And then what we see around the stories that are from the Old Testament is uh, what are called sibyls and then prophets. So sibyls are basically the same as prophets, but from ancient Greece. Uh, and then the prophets are ones from the Old Testament. So the idea here is, is to talk about how Jesus was prefigured in the Old Testament uh, and that um, they predicted some of these things. And then there was a belief that had developed during this time um, in Italy that the ancient Greeks were also predicting Christ. So taking these very Renaissance thing to do, taking these ancient Greek ideas and recasting them, in a um, Renaissance context. So this is the way it used to look. It was restored over a very long period of time, from 1977 to 1989. And some people, um, including some art historians, were surprised by the bright colors that were revealed by the restoration. And the most prominent critic that kind of stayed a critic was this art historian, James Brick Beck. Uh, and he claimed that when they cleaned it, uh, and they revealed these really bright colors that they were taking away some kind of painting that Michelangelo had done at the end to tame the colors. So you're kind of seeing why I showed you that painting in the beginning that's uh, 
that shows the bright colors that Michelangelo had used. Um, I don't think James Beck has a leg to stand on. Uh, I think the bright colors are original. So this is the way it looks. Oh, it's so beautifully bright. Um, so the restoration, um, it was opposed by our historian James Beck. Um, some of the blues that we see in the background, they were repainted due to natural pigment denigration. Um, so we get that basic story. So it goes in order. Um, it starts with uh, the story from Genesis uh, and goes all the way to the drunkenness of Noah. <laughs> so it, it tells the early story of Christianity that comes from the ancient Jewish Bible. So here's the story, division of light from darkness. And this is pretty much straight from one of the Genesis narratives. Uh, in Genesis, there's basically two creation narratives. Uh, and generally people at this time didn't really see it that way. So they'll take liberally from both. Um, so the creation of Adam is one of the ones we'll look at. The fall and the expulsion, we've seen this before. Um, so it's not important to know all of these themes. I just wanted to let you know how it's working. And then when you look around, you can see that all the prophets um, are portrayed as masculine figures uh, and all of the sibyls are portrayed as feminine figures. Um, but we'll see when we get in close that all the bodies are massive. So when you get in close, you can really see some details, kind of amazing. And again, these are all illusions. This isn't real molding. It's just painted in such a way that it looks like real. They love the illusions. So this is probably the most famous painting from this collection on the ceiling. And there's some interesting interpretations of this piece. And I'm going to present some of these interpretations, uh, but it's one of those things that hasn't been generally accepted by historians, but it is kind of interesting. And I think there's some validity to it. So I'll present some of those ideas. Um, in addition to depicting the creation of humans in the image of God, it can also be interpreted as depicting the creation of God in the image of humans. The inter interpretation is consistent with the mystical strains of Renaissance thought and explains the shape of God's cape, which is that of a cross-section of the human brain. Um, so this idea of this shape um, being a human brain was first proposed by a medical doctor, Frank Merschberger, in 1990. And I think this is part of the reason why art historians haven't really looked at it. Um, I think they may, some may look at it as um, invading their turf. Um, but I think there's some validity to it. Uh, and I personally think that people should invade the turf of, of other disciplines. Uh, we can learn some new things sometimes and get a fresh type of idea. Um, so one of this is the creation of humans in the image of God. Uh, the creation of God in the image of humans. This is actually a thing that is sometimes thought of, uh, even in the context of Christianity and in some strains of Judaism. Um, so it makes sense that we would see this sort of thing. Uh, and in a way, it seems backwards or maybe um, even like verging on atheism. Um, but it is a belief that kind of shows the specialness of humans in a way. Um, and people that believe this don't necessarily see themselves as putting themselves or putting humanity above, above God with a capital G. So part of the reason why Michelangelo might have put this in here uh, and kind of hit, hide it a little bit is because there is a, the official belief of the Catholic Church at this time is that the heart is the location of the soul. Um, but... Michelangelo, who had, this is kind of gross, had found cadavers of people who were hanged, um, which was a standard method of execution for criminals, um, and dissected some of them to learn about anatomy, um, that he thought that the soul must be located in the brain uh, because that's the thing that can kill people uh, is by disconnecting their brain from the rest of their body. Um, but again, that belief wasn't an official belief. Uh, it kind of makes sense in the context of the way that people think of the soul and the body or the mind and the body, mind and soul being kind of a similar idea. But at the time, 
it wasn't something that you could put out there. Um, and it was because it was against the official uh, doctrine of the church. So it makes sense that he would hide something like this because Michelangelo uh, doesn't like to be told what to do. <laughs> um, but he is realistic, so uh, there is a possibility to this. Um, so these are pictures from Leonardo. We don't have like a lot of drawings from Michelangelo as far as his anatomy studies. Uh, and you can see how it doesn't quite show the brain um, as we see it, like those brain in a vat type of pictures that you might see in an old horror movie or something like that. Um, but it's possible that Michelangelo had a more accurate view of it. But again, this could be uh, perhaps evidence against uh, Frank Merschberger's claim. When you get in close, you can see that he's using heavy black outlines. And that's because, uh, remember, the, the ceiling is pretty high up. He wants to transmit these images down to the floor. Uh, so by using these heavy black outlines, it kind of makes the figures stick out. It's not something he would do if he had a close painting like the Tondo that we looked at in the first slide. So when you get really close, you can really see the black outlines. But again, this makes everything, uh, putting black outlines on things just makes the colors stand out more. Uh, it makes the details stand out a bit more so you can see them from the floor. So it's almost like a moment of creation. Uh, you know, if this was made in the 19th century, like in a Frankenstein novel, uh, we would see electricity um, kind of traveling between their fingers. You can also see something interesting that's going on. Um, Adam's fingers, uh, they look like no work has been done because literally they're thinking of God creating um, this man fully grown and he hasn't done any work. And when he's in the Garden of Eden, he doesn't have to. But however, Michelangelo shows God's hands as he would show his own uh, with these knobby knuckles that are from a lifetime of work. So if you get in close, you notice there's uh, a feminine figure. And um, most of the time, our historians look at this and they say, hmm, uh, that's probably Eve, uh, and she's ready to be slotted in. Um, but a lot believe that she's Mary, um, and because this figure seems to be a Christ figure, uh, it could be both, though. Um, so the thought of Eve as the first woman and then Mary as kind of like the second first woman, uh, the first woman of an era of salvation uh, would kind of work here. So it could be either. And you'll notice there's a line of sight that goes all the way to Jesus. So it's almost like Adam, uh, who, remember, commits the first sin with Eve, uh, is pointing towards the salvation that Jesus will bring. But, you know, another interpretation is it could just be a pooty, which is like a naked baby with wings, because uh, we see a bunch of those here, and it could be Eve. Um, it kind of makes sense if it would be Eve, because we'll see that the Eve figure in the later pictures looks kind of similar. So this one, um, the fall, this is showing the picture, and there's a serpent right here who talks, and he makes it like a feminine figure. Uh, so very patriarchal way of looking at things. Eve commits the first sin uh, and commits Adam. Um, so we see her committing the first sin, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Um, but it also, uh, I, th I found an interesting like kind of class assignment that another professor had done about this picture. Uh, and many of the students in that class thought that something may have been interrupted in this particular moment. Uh, so you can take that as you will. But you'll notice with the Eve figure, uh, very similar face that we saw, you know, pretty feminine, pretty um, usual Renaissance type face, but her body is very muscular. Um, and that's something that Michelangelo does in general. Um, he uses male models for um, the feminine figure bodies uh, and basically just puts breasts on them, more or less. Uh, so we can see the fall illustrated here. Uh, so looking all innocent and fine. And at the end, uh, they're bent over. Um, and we see the same sort of shame uh, going on with Eve here, uh, but not with Adam. We can actually see his face and we can see emotion being expressed. So Michelangelo, who is a very kind of 
tortured being, very emotional being. Um, he's not afraid to show some emotion in men's faces. So when you go around, you find pictures of the sibyls and the prophets. So the prophets, in this case, the prophet Joel, is portrayed as an old man, um, but still with these huge giant bodies. So the kind of effect of these giant bodies is to show, show this is important. This is something that's happening for the ages. Um, and he's including this orange cloak, uh, which is the standard way to show Joel. Uh, if you ever get a chance to visit the Detroit Institute of Art, you find that many of these uh, Jerome paintings with these orange cloaks. So that's how we know who he is. And he's got a scroll rolled out. So the prophets write down their predictions uh, and Christians believe that those predictions later turned out to be about Christ. So we see the same thing with the Sibyls, which are figures from ancient Greece. Uh, they're diviners who um, powerful people go to them and ask them for advice. Uh, and this is the Delphic Sibyl. So um, Del Delphi was a city, so they had different diviners for each city, uh, and they were always women in, in ancient Greece. So he's giving us a feminine figure, a pretty typical face, what he had done before, uh, but again, with these massive kind of like masculine bodies. And just like the prophets, um, they hold their writing that shows their predictions. So Christians believe uh, perhaps the Greek Sibyls had predicted Christ as well. Um, so this one, uh, human Sibyl, showing as an older woman, but again, with this like massive kind of um, more masculine body that comes from um, masculine at the time. Uh, we'll see some massive feminine bodies a little bit later on. Um, that comes from using male models. So this one, we actually have some drawings left over from Michelangelo and we can see. Um, so a lot of back work went into this. Uh, and when you look at this picture, you can kind of see a motion to it. Uh, you can see that this book, it's almost like she's going to lift this incredibly heavy thing and then bring it down in a sweeping motion to read it. Uh, and it's an implied motion. So how do you do that? Uh, he didn't really figure out how to do it when he first did the drawings, but he figured it out uh, a little bit later. The early drawings show a figure where both arms are at the same length level. Uh, in this one, we see... Um, the left arm downwards, and it gives us impression of motion. So as he got older, his idea of taking these bodies and having them express themes and subjects and, and content uh, is what he continued, and this is what is very influential about him. The idea that you can deviate from naturalism, and all of these figures deviate pretty far from naturalism, um, and that way you can tell a story more efficiently. So this is the last judgment and it's done when he's already old. He had a lot of health problems, so he was in pain a lot. Uh, and some of that is reflected uh, in here. Um, sometimes Christians will think of the pain that they suffer and they'll think of it as a punishment for sin. So Michelangelo, when he gets older, uh, starts to regret the way that he had treated people, um, kind of known for being <laughs> a, an asshole, for lack of a better word. Um, and we see a little bit of that in this picture. So it's a pretty standard way of, of creating the last judgment in that we see figures that are towards the bottom and um, over here as ones that are being damned uh, and then ones that are towards the top as being figures that could go to heaven. And one way to look at this is generally is to uh, turn it around and think of it through Christ's eyes and if you do, you look to Christ's left, uh, and you'll find that there's more damned people on this side. And when you look to Christ's right, remember from his point of view, um, we'll see uh, more of the kind of like special figures that are going to heaven. So in the Last Judgment, um, it's believed that um, Christians believe that their bodies and souls will be reconnected, uh, and then Jesus will judge them um, and you can see and on whether or not they would go to heaven or hell. Uh, and th with this one, we can see that Jesus, he is um, kind of using his power liberally. Uh, it seems to be sweeping down as if he's going to throw bolts of lightning like, like he was Zeus. He's actually pictured as Apollo, which was the first way in very early Christianity uh, 
1200 years before this picture was made um, to show Christ. And uh, we see a sun behind him. So this is an Apollo Christ, not a bearded one. Uh, and Michelangelo is, is recalling uh, the way that Jesus is portrayed sometimes. And then we have Mary right next to him, uh, pictured in a young way, just like he did with his Pieta sculpture. Uh, and then a bunch of other figures that we can recognize that we'll look at in a little bit more detail. Um, so some of these figures um, are shown as nude. And remember, it's kind of comes from ancient Greece. Uh, it's the idea that you can show heroism. But you can see how the bodies have gotten even thicker to the point where the heads look really small on top of these massive bodies. Uh, but again, that's a way that Michelangelo shows this is important. This is an intense moment. Uh, so when you get in close, you can identify a figure. Uh, since John the Baptist, since he wanted all the figures to be nude, uh, the way to show John the Baptist is with some fur. He gave him this like little fur G-string, and that way we know he's John the Baptist. Instead of pointing to Jesus, he just kind of looks in Jesus's direction. So similar to what we saw before, uh, but with a little bit more drama and intensity. And then when we go to the other side of Jesus, uh, we can see Peter, and we know that it's him because we have keys in the Bible. Jesus says in the Gospels, Jesus says that um, he's going to give Peter the keys to heaven. Uh, so this is a Sistine Chapel. This is the Pope's chapel, his personal chapel. So he always wants to have Peter in here. Uh, and he wants to show Peter, who is traditionally believed to be the first Pope, he wants to show, hey, I deserve my power. So uh, taking statements like that, uh, you always want to put Peter in there if you're painting for the Pope. So this mess of bodies coming around, showing the intensity of this moment. Uh, we can look a little bit closer at this figure right here, which seems rather gruesome. It's a figure holding a knife uh, and a, like some skin. And this represents Bartholomew. Um, all of the closest followers of Jesus, which are called apostles, um, all of them except for John uh, suffered a, in some, some cases, like a gruesome end. So they are all martyred. Um, Bartholomew was particularly gruesome. Uh, it was believed that he was captured and then he was executed by flailing, uh, which means to peel off one's skin. Uh, so we see the knife of Bartholomew and then we see him holding this kind of like skin sack. Um, some people look at the face and they say that's a self-portrait. Um, so uh, in some ways, some Christians will look at the awful martyrdom of the apostles to represent um, to represent when they betrayed Jesus and left him when he was being executed, so they had to suffer through their martyrdom. Um, so we can kind of see that idea with Michelangelo going on, where he's showing himself suffering and perhaps a way to make up for the way that he had treated people throughout life uh, and not being such a, a great person. Um, and again, also he's suffering from a lot of health problems at this time uh, and really feels like it might be a punishment for his sins. This is a theme we're going to see later with some, some later artists, the new Michelangelo and the, and the next style that we'll study afterwards. So some of the twisted figures uh, are probably related to, and there's a lot of good reasons to think this, we'd already seen it. Um, this particular sculpture, which is the Laocoon group, which was discovered in 1506 in Rome. It's a marble sculpture, but it was a copy of an original Greek one. And the way that the body is arranged uh, had a big influence on a lot of artists. We've already, um, it had influences in ancient artists as well. Um, but it'll have an influence on um, the more emotional work that we're going to see a little bit later on. So it's not important to know the story about Laocoon, uh, but it's basically talking about punishment from the gods. So we see a lot of these kind of twisted figures, which becomes a theme uh, based on this Laocoon. So on the bottom right, uh, we see Hell's mouth right here. 
Uh, so it's believed that in this last judgment um, at the end of the world, uh, Christians believe that some people will be damned to hell. Uh, so we see um, figures kind of being dragged down. And if it looks like kind of like a horror movie scene, uh, that is pretty common for this genre. Um, people have been doing, artists have been doing this for hundreds of years at this point. So we get in a little bit close. It looks like the Halloween decorations outside of my house. Uh, we can see these twisted and um, maimed and, and figures that look like corpses um, down below. So showing in a kind of eternal death that is hell. Uh, more figures here as you get closer to the ground. Uh, again, using those black outlines so things stick out from far away. Um, lots of skulls, reminders of death. Uh, and then he did a kind of interesting thing here. Um, this is uh, Karen, uh, who's the gatekeeper of the River Styx, uh, which is the river that um, is between uh, the real world and the underworld in Greek mythology. The underworld in Greek mythology doesn't function quite as hell like hell does in Christianity, um, but it was a good image, so it's used in that way. Um, by Christian artists. Um, so it's kind of cool in that uh, he's feeling bad about his sins, right, in the other part. But here um, he's getting a little bit of revenge with the way that he portrays uh, Karen. Um, so Karen is actually similar. The face looks very similar to a particular cardinal who had complained about the painting as it was being done. Um, the painting uh, has all of these nudes and this cardinal looked at it and he said, this is awful. They shouldn't have all these nude figures uh, in this sacred scene. Uh, so Michelangelo um, kind of puts a face on there uh, to show um, that idea. Um, and this one isn't quite the one, the person who complained, but He's kind of putting faces of people he doesn't like on some of these figures. Uh, so this is a good example. Uh, this is Minos, the king of Crete. Uh, and you can read that story. It's not super important for us to know it. But he's portrayed as Biagio de uh, Cesena, a Vatican official who thought the Last Judgment's nudity was inappropriate for the Vatican. Um, and <laughs> so what does he do? Uh, Michelangelo takes his face. He had a cleft palate. Um, so everybody knows who it is, uh, including <laughs> Biagio de Cesena, who totally saw this. Uh, and he shows a snake biting his genitals. So don't complain to an artist, because uh, 500 years later, an art historian will be talking about it. Um, so very clear that it is this particular figure. Uh, I think he complained to the Pope later on. The Pope was like, what are you going to do? It's Michelangelo. So some of these portraits of suffering, um, again, he's not afraid to show uh, masculine emotion in the face. So we can see that here. Uh, remember, Christians believe that there's basically two options. You can go to heaven where you're in this divine presence in eternity, a kind of eternal bliss. Uh, and then there's hell where you're tortured forever. Uh, so this figure as they're being dragged down um, is having the most dread you could possibly imagine, eyes wide open, brow furrowed, um, face just coiled in horror. And then Jesus, shown as an Apollo figure. Uh, so Apollo in ancient Greece, uh, in ancient Rome, was shown as having this long flowing hair. Uh, Apollo uh, went in the chariot through the sky and dragged the sun. Uh, so he was always shown with the sun. And then the earliest images of Jesus they were made by Greek and Roman artists. Uh, so they portrayed him as Apollo because that seemed to match. Uh, he's in the Bible. They talk about him being Emmanuel, the light of the world. Uh, so that matches pretty well. Uh, and the idea of a halo is actually derived from this way of showing Jesus as Apollo with the sun behind him. Then we have Mary, same young Mary that we saw in Pieta. So again, showing her innocence. 